Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Chaim Angel. I'm the National Scholar for the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals. This is the third and final installment of our series on Kohelet. This is going to be something I've never really done before. Uh, the first two shiurim are more my, my bread and butter, just going through a text, trying to understand the central themes, what its ideology is, all of those good things. Today, we're going to actually review four very, very recent books, all published in 2023 on Kohelet. It's, it's just, they're coming out in droves, which is very exciting. So the last couple of months, I've been plowing through these books, trying to get a sense of what they're all about, how they operate. And so the names of the books are down here at the bottom of the source sheet, which I hope you can see. I'm sharing it. Uh, Jonathan Grossman came out with a book, or it's about to come out, from Magid Press Koren in Hebrew. That's, that's his native language. The other three are in English. One is Erica Brown as part of the Magid Tanakh series, commentary series. So she is the one who wrote on Kohelet, Ecclesiastes is the English word for that. You have Menachem Fish, who's a philosopher more than a Tanakh person. Uh, he is writing about Kohelet because he is a philosopher. And so Kohelet definitely is a thoughtful, thoughtful man. I wouldn't call him philosopher in a typical sense, but biblically speaking, is probably the book that comes closest to a work of philosophy. So that's something that he found very attractive. And then one is by somebody named David Kerwin, who's an educator in Israel. And so he came up with this, with this book called Kohelet, A Map to Eden. So over the course of this morning, we're going to go through all four of them in terms of their central themes. I should, before even getting too involved, let's see if I can, oh, let's see if I can actually do this. I'm gonna turn this off for a second. And what I'm gonna do is send it to you so that way you have it and then let's see if I can do this. I'm not sure if it's going to let me do it. Okay, so I take that back. I'm just going to get it back on our screen and we will do our best. Okay, there it is again. Here are you again. Okay, and then I'm going to share it again. And then we're going to go, then we're going to get going. Okay. So the journal called Tradition, which is the jour scholarly journal of the Rabbinical Council of America, invited me to write reviews of these four books. And our plan, I'll tell you the truth, the you get the inside scoop of this one. Uh, the plan was to write one review that would kind of let the four books be in dialogue with one another. Here, here, here's the issue in Kohelet. Here's how these four different people take stands on this. It'll be really cool. I thought it was a great idea. I loved it. I was so excited to do this. And as soon as I actually read the four books, I realized, okay, that's going to be, uh, if not impossible, it at least doesn't seem very likely for me. And the reason is because they're not four commentaries on Kohelet with the same set of axioms or assumptions or methodologies at all. They're four very intelligent, learned writers. Each one has his or her style that's so different that I'm like, okay, they're not really in dialogue. Here's just four different ways to approach Kohelet. So I thought that was cool. And that's in fact what we're going to do is just go through them one by one to talk about what each one does and then you can decide which ones sound good to you and you can go out there and get them. I mean, at least three are available already. I think Jonathan Grossman's will come out soon. I don't, I don't think it's available yet, but I think it's, it, it will be out very soon. The other three certainly are in print. And so that's the, way, that's the way we're going to do it. So we're simply going to go in the order of the books the way I presented them here. Okay, so again, here are their titles and I will try to figure out a way of getting this to you. Oh, maybe I could just, Maybe I could do that. I could at least get you the titles. Chat. Chat is here. Okay. Yep. Bingo. All right. So there you go. Now you have all four titles. I'm happy and good. So you can decide which ones sound good to you based on this review, or you can decide which one sounds appealing based on anything else you would like. All right, so we'll start with Jonathan Grossman. The reason why we're starting with him is because he's probably one of my five favorite Tanakh teachers in the world today. I'm a huge fan of his. He's very young. He's probably in his low 50s, uh, but he's certainly established himself as one, as one of the premier uh, Tanakh scholars in the world today. He's really an unbelievable blend of 
traditional scholarship. He knows how to do that very well. That, that's his background, but he also has a, an astonishingly good command of the academic scholarship on anything, which is good. You need really to have both. And so he finds a way of, of bridging those two worlds seamlessly. That's his strength in general. Now, many of his books up until now have been on what we think of as the story books in Tanakh. He's written on Genesis, he's written on Ruth, he's written on Esther, uh, but here he took on Kohelet. And he does the exact same thing with Kohelet that he does with the, with the other books. His general gist of how he does things is he writes an introduction that covers uh, the scholarly discussion of the major overall global issues that need to be addressed when you learn Kohelet. He does that. And then he has a verse by verse commentary through which he, you know, he goes through every single verse. He evaluates the history of scholarship when needed. He puts out the primary opinions and then he gives his own personal slant on all of it. So obviously we can't go through the whole book because that really is, if you want to learn Kohelet systematically and your Hebrew is good, that's the book to read. It's, you know, it's really the up-to-date commentary on Kohelet and it covers primarily Hebrew scholarship, but certainly much English, the major English scholarship works also. And it's something which I think is, is very accessible. It's not written in one of those esoteric uh, academic Hebrew. He, he writes it in a way that if your Hebrew is good, you would be able to read it, no problem. So, he basically learns Kohelet in a similar manner from how we've been learning it, just because he and I read the same things. So it's not surprising that we're going to come at least to roughly similar conclusions, even if we might quibble with one another on this or that point. But at least fundamentally, that's the book that will come closest to what we've discussed the last two weeks, just because he's interested in the same questions that I'm in and interested in, in terms of just what does Kohelet actually mean, both in terms of the words, its context, its, its setting, and what are the overall messages of the book? So he pretty much addresses those questions and he addresses them, I think, very, very, very well. Uh, he talks about the very important necessity to distinguish between King Solomon and the book of Kohelet, even though it's traditionally ascribed to him, and has King Solomon's life in the background. But it's not about King Solomon, it's about us. It's about every person, past, present, future, and our religious experience and encounter with God in our finite state in this world. So even though Kohelet is, has this persona of King Solomon underlying it and it's in your face, he's saying, hi, I'm the wisest and wealthiest person ever. Okay, great. That's what gives him credibility to talk to the rest of us. If he were a life failure, we wouldn't want to listen to him. It's like, okay, fine, you're bitter, but we're going to do better. The whole point is that he had it all and he can actually evaluate properly what is the enduring value of wealth and what is the enduring value of wisdom? So he does an excellent job with that. He all, Rabbi Grossman also points out, Rabbi Dr. Grossman, he's both, uh, also points out that Kohelet is purely universalistic. There's nothing in Kohelet about the Torah, about the God-Israel relationship. It's about every God-fearing person on the planet, just every human being and our experience and our encounter with God. There's no difference between Jew and non-Jew in Kohelet, God is all of our creator. We all are expected to have some relationship with God. And that's the kind of relationship that you will find in Kohelet. Uh, he also points out quite correctly that Kohelet is a human voice talking about God and standing before God rather than a divine voice speaking to a person as through prophecy. Even if Kohelet is divinely inspired, we hear the human wisdom of this book. These are things that we talked about in the first two weeks of this mini course. Okay, one of the most important words in Kohelet that you just really have to get around is the word Hevel. Hevel appears 38 times in this book out of a total of 73 in the whole Bible. So however you interpret this word is going to greatly shift and affect how you understand the whole book and what its point is. Sources one and two over here are just the inclusio. They're the bracketing for the entire book. The book begins with utter futility again. The word is Hevel, and the JPS translation that I've blocked and pasted for the sake of my convenience uh, translates it futility, which is a classic way of understanding the word for the record. But we'll get back to that in just a moment. So utter Hevel, said Kohelet. Utter Hevel, all is Hevel. And then at the end of the book, utter Hevel, said Kohelet, all is Hevel. Okay, so whatever Hevel is, the whole book is surrounded by it and suffused by it. Okay, so what does Hevel mean? So it obviously sounds like it's something negative. 
I, I wouldn't want to be involved in Hevel too much. If you go through Kohelet, you find that Hevel is linked with other terms like Ra'a Raba, which means a great evil. Or in Yan Ra, it's a really unhappy business. Or Choli Ra, a, a grievous illness. Okay, so if you have Hevel and bad business, illness, grave evil, you get the point. Whatever Hevel is, it's something that you don't want to encounter too often, although Kohelet reminds you, uh, it's all that's life. It, it, there always will be all these Havalim, there, there will be all kinds of Hevel that affects us, but it still doesn't define the term. So we just know that it's something that Kohelet does not like, and he, and he uses it as a means of complaining about life experiences. So in order to understand what it means, you really have to look at the other biblical references to see, are there any that narrow it down a bit? And sure enough, you will find that there are a few places in Tanakh where it does. Uh, in many contexts, Hevel is like a breath, like we breathe, or vapor. Okay, so the idea here would be, Hevel would be something along the lines of ephemeral, fleeting. The idea is that life is temporary, and that's certainly a very important theme in Kohelet. And so one track of interpretation that you will find commentaries using is that Hevel, like a breath, is fleeting. Okay, so that's a good one. Then there's another one where you go through other passages in Tanakh, and Hevel is linked to terms like Shav and Sheker. Shav and Sheker are nothingness and deceit or lie. So from that perspective, you get the translation that you often have, which is futility or vanity. The idea is that life is worthless. It's futile. There's nothing coming out of that. So I would say that through the history of interpretation, those are the top two. Something to do with breath, vapor, fleeting, or worthless. It's, there's emptiness to it all. Life has no meaning. Life is empty. The problem with both of those interpretations, which Rabbi Grossman points out correctly, and he's not the first one to point this out, is that there are places in Kohelet where whatever Hevel means, he's describing a persistent human condition. He's not describing something that is fleeting. He's describing something that is always going to be there, and it's upsetting. For example, source number three. For sometimes a person whose fortune was made with wisdom, knowledge, and skill must hand it on to the, be the portion of somebody who did not toil for it. That too is futile and a grave evil. He's not describing something that is bad because it will go away. He's saying this is something that will always be true sometimes. Or for what does a man get for all the toiling and worrying he does under the sun? All his days, his thoughts are grief and heartache. Even at night, his mind has no respite. That too is futile. Once again, he's not describing a temporary state of affairs. He's describing a permanent condition within the human experience. There are bunches of times in Kohelet where that's the reality. So if you translate it as fleeting, that's good some of the time. If you translate it as vanity or futile, that's also good some of the time. But it can't possibly be the whole story. And that's what we got to deal with here. So uh, Michael V. Fox, who I've mentioned in the previous sessions, uh, comes up with the idea that Hevel in Kohelet means absurd. The advantage of absurd is that means it's incomprehensible, you can't make order of it, and sense. So scholars get on his case, because even though that actually is a very appealing interpretation, they say, but wait a second, where in Tanakh does Hevel refer to a concept like absurdity? It always refers to something like a breath, vapor, something that's tangible. But other scholars have come to Fox's defense and point out, okay, fine. The idea is fleeting and vaporous. Just as vapor dissipates and you can't really hold on to it, so too you can't hold on to these ideas of life. Jonathan Grossman basically comes to the same conclusion, which is that uh, Hevel in Kohelet should be defined as something along the lines of chaotic and lacking order. Just like breath is something that you can't grab or can't grasp, and even though it's there, so too, every time you think you've made order and sense out of the world, you find out that's not really so. So I find this not only very appealing, but it simply matches what the biblical evidence has to say about the word Hevel. So I think, I think Jonathan Grossman does a good job surveying the literature, surveying the biblical evidence, and coming to that conclusion, which seems to be at least on the right track, much better than either fleeting or vanity slash futility. Okay. Kohelet also, as, as Jonathan Grossman points out time and again, uh, constantly attacks the necessary correlation between either wisdom and a good life or hard work and a good life. He doesn't say, therefore, don't be wise or don't work hard. 
He's just saying that you can be very, very righteous and not necessarily lead a good life. You can work very diligently and fail. That should not be. And that's something which is Hevel. That's something which, again, creates this lack of order that's absurd, that's vaporous. However you want to translate that, that's a regular recurring theme in Kohelet. And Jonathan Grossman does an excellent job in pointing all of these out. Uh, Grossman, because he lives in the 21st century too, is privy to a new track, which we've spoken about already. Uh, there are many contradictions in Kohelet that we talked about back in week one. So starting the 20th century, a new track of interpretation to these uh, contradictions came onto the map, which is the reason why Kohelet is so contradictory is because life is filled with contradictions and complexities. Before the 20th century, that was simply not an available option. Not that life was so simple back then either, just that interpreters were not thinking about the question, why are there so many contradictions? They were busy solving the contradictions. The 20th century is what brought us to the new question, and that led to a new answer, which is very productive. So his big contribution, I think, of everything is his final chapter of the book, where he says that you know, there are many, many, many places, starting with source number four, there is nothing worthwhile for a man but to eat and drink and afford himself enjoyment with his means. Even that I noted comes from God, for who eats and who enjoys but myself. This is a recurring refrain running through the entire book. Here's one of my favorite examples at source number five. Go eat your bread in gladness and drink your wine in joy. For your action was long ago approved by God. Let your clothes always be freshly washed and your head never lack ointment. Enjoy happiness with a woman you love all the fleeting days of life that I've been granted to you under the sun, all your fleeting days. For that alone is what you can get out of life and out of the means you acquire under the sun. Whatever is in your power to do, do with all your might. For there is no action, no reasoning, no learning, no wisdom in Sheol where you are going. This just keeps on coming. And the gist of it is, this is the message of the whole book. Yes, life really is fleeting. Everybody is going to die. Wealth is not lasting. Even our wisdom cannot outlive us. But that doesn't mean that all is worthless. We should live a productive, good, wise, righteous life. That means living righteously. That means pursuing wisdom. That means working diligently. And every time we have anything, we should enjoy it as a blessing from God rather than feeling entitled about it. We talked about these things in week one. So Grossman says that all of these verses that say enjoy God's blessings, he says that the whole book is structured around that. That's actually a huge contribution because scholars have a rough time pinning down what exactly is the structure of the book. So he says that this theme is such a recurring theme, it actually is how the book is structured. So he breaks down the entire book into sections based on these concluded conclusions that, yes, life has its struggles, it has its frustrations, we're not going to solve any of them, they're simply the human experience, but at least we can enjoy our blessing. So as a result of that, he comes up with his conclusion at the, at the very, very end of the commentary, where he says in Hebrew, but I'll translate it for you, meaning for humankind is not rooted in the great and broad worlds of religious longing which prods people to gather vast wisdom to become a prophet or to bring the Messiah. That's true. Kohelet has none of that stuff. He's not talking about the big ideas. He's not talking about messianic redemption. Uh, it occurs with the religious experience of observing the commandments and sipping a cup of tea with mint or herbs. That is a gift from God. So the one serious point of dispute I have with him is that I have zero doubt that had Kohelet lived today, he would be a very strong coffee drinker and not an herbal tea drinker. There's no question in my mind. I think that Grossman is mistaken or perhaps imposing his own preferences for hot beverages onto Kohelet. Other than that, the point is generally correct, which is Kohelet is not focused on the big ideas because the big ideas don't outlive us. What he's interested in, in his limited human perspective, is how to live a good, modest life that's righteous. Don't overdo it. I would just add to Grossman, I think he overplays that point to the exclusion of other major lessons, which he talks about all through the course of his commentary, but I think that he could have brought them home at the end of the book too. Uh, fearing God, pursuing wisdom, working diligently, having religious humility, and never being obsessive about the pursuit of either wisdom or wealth. Okay, so those I think have to be added to, if I had to write a summary conclusion of, okay, what's Kohelet really all about in a paragraph? I would mention the, what, what Rabbi Grossman mentions, but also add these other points, which I believe are equally central to the book. Okay, so until now, that's Grossman. It's a wonderful, wonderful commentary, and because he is so well-versed in the scholarship, both traditional and academic, it's really a one-stop shopping if you just want to get up-to-date on Kohelet scholarship as of 2023. He does a, a splendid job. 
okay, I can't wait for the actual book because as I think I may have mentioned as a, as a lament on my part is because I got these things as PDF files. So I had, I don't know how many pages, I didn't bother adding well over a thousand uh, pieces of paper all over my, scattered all over my desk as I was trying to sort through uh, the four books, but at least three of the four are now in print and so I'm happy about that. And God willing, Rabbi Grossman's will be and that will end up on my shelf as well. Okay, so that's, that's the Jonathan Grossman piece of this story. We go down to book number two, which is Erica Brown, Ecclesiastes and the Search for Meaning. So that's part of the English Magi Tanakh series. She's also written on Yona as well as Esther. So Erica Brown, her style is very different from Jonathan Grossman. I, it's, it's also a very lengthy commentary, but I, I, it has an element of commentary in it, just like her other volumes do. The commentary part is she really is well-versed in, in the Pshat scholarship. She does care about what the text means a lot, and she has a very good command of basic Pshat commentaries, the classical Midrashim, the class Rashi, Ibn Ezra, the, really the classical commentaries. And she also has read several important academic studies on Kohelet as well in the more modern era. But Erica Brown's focus isn't on what does Kohelet mean. Her focus is way more on what meaning of life can we derive based on the ideas of Kohelet. So for her, uh, what makes her book so splendid is it's just a fantastic array of sources, both traditional Jewish sources, but also works of philosophy, psychology, literature, poetry, art, contemporary sociology study, studies, you name it. She is unbelievably well read. And so whenever she talks about a topic, she simply presents an essay scouring the wisdom of humanity and bringing that to bear on the verses that are in question. So just to give a couple of brief examples, that's what that's why these books can't be in dialogue, by the way, folks. Uh, they're, they're not operating on the same plane. One is trying to get with what is Kohelet really all about? And the other one is given that Kohelet basically means this, what is life all about? These are two very important questions, but they're simply different questions. And as a result, there's very little overlap between the two books. So one example, just I think I have it in our source sheet. I do. How about that? Source number six over here, just to give you an example. Even if a man should beget a hundred children and live many years, no matter how many the days of his years may come to, if his gullet is not sated through his wealth, I say, the stillbirth, though it was not even accorded a burial, is more fortunate than he. The idea is wealth is temporary, and if you don't enjoy it while you can, what's the point? And Kohelet in his classic dramatic, make you depressed type of language, he says it's better not to have been born at all. Okay, so I get it. I think you get it too. It's a very straightforward message with fabulous rhetoric that tells you, look, God is giving you a limited amount of time in this world. Please enjoy it as a blessing while you can. If you don't or are unable to, that's really sad. And then you can't even benefit from the life that God has given us. Okay, Erica Brown quotes this verse in her, her, her essays on chapter six, and her main point is to, to discuss the psychology of stillborns, not of them, because they don't have a lot of psychology, but the, how the stillborn affects the family. Obviously, it's devastating. I think you don't need any sociological, psychological studies to figure out this is one of the worst things that could possibly happen to anybody. It's truly traumatic and hideous. But she does a wonderful job simply citing wisdom throughout the ages, talking about stillbirth, and then talking about how that language becomes all the more poignant when you appreciate what that really means and how Kohelet is using it. That's not a point of a commentator. That's the point of somebody who cares about human wisdom and is using that human wisdom to bring, to shed broader light on the ideas that you find in Kohelet. Or another example from Erica Brown. A lover of money, this is source seven. A lover of money never has his fill of money, nor a lover of wealth his fill of income. That too is futile. That's, it's crazy. People never are satisfied. What's up? Okay, I don't think I need a commentary to understand that verse. I think that the verse stands on its own, makes perfect sense. Kohelet, like any good wisdom, would tell you, don't be greedy. Try to be satisfied with your lot. Work hard, earn an honest living, of course. Don't be bankrupt. But if you become insatiable, it's, it's just a total waste and, and it ruins your life. Okay, 
So Erica Brown moves in and quotes this fabulous article in a journal called The Atlantic, it's from 2011, where they interviewed well over 100 people that are defined in this article as, quote, the super rich. The super rich, as far as this article is concerned, it's not my definition or your definition, it's this article, uh, interviewed only people who have a minimum of $25 million. If you have 20 million, you're pretty well to do, but you're not the super rich as far as this article is concerned. The super rich in this article, 25 million and above. So they asked them about all kinds of satisfaction with life type of questions. I don't think you need Erica Brown to tell you that people who have a lot of money are not necessarily happier people in any sense. I was not surprised to hear that. They have woes just like anybody else can have woes and some of them are living very happy, comfortable lives, just like somebody with a lot less than $25 million also might be. It might be cool to see data, that's fine. What was interesting to me, and this is the part that I wanted to quote, share with you for this verse, is that they interviewed them to say, do you think you have enough money? That's a different question from, are you a happy person in every respect? They might have an unhappy family life. They might have other woes to deal with. Okay, fine. It's sad, but I understand that that money can't solve that stuff. And sometimes it helps create it. It depends on the situation. But I thought that at least if you have $25 million or more, some of these people might say, okay, I actually do have enough money. Nope. Uh, nearly the, on average, on average, based on this study, with, again, well over 100 people were interviewed, they require a minimum of 25% more than what they currently have before they think that they would have enough. Okay, now, for those of us who are not part of the super rich, such as me, I read stuff like this, I'm like, that is insane. I mean, I'm sorry, there comes a point where, okay, you might want to keep up with whatever Joneses are on your in your wealthy neighborhood or your island, wherever you happen to be. I don't care. That's not my problem. But you would still think, but that should still count as a satisfactory amount of money by any measure. Wrong. One person who was interviewed said that until they have a billion dollars, they will not be satisfied. I'm like, okay, and good luck. And somehow I'll bet you by the time they reach that billion, if they ever do, well, you know, times have changed, inflation, it's not enough anymore. Now we need more. Uh, so I, I bring all of this to say that this is what Erica Brown is doing throughout her book. So you have this verse over here just telling you what Co Kohelet says it already, right? A lover of money never has his fill of money, nor a lover of wealth is fill of income. That too is futile. Okay, you don't need the study to prove the point. You understand the verse without the study. But the study cer certainly helps bring it to life in terms of, wow, here's a recent study of a lot of people who really prove this point nicely just on the basis of their dissatisfaction specifically with the amount of wealth that they have which i think is really very interesting so basically erica brown's book which i think is over 500 pages long is filled with amazing things like that just a lot of insights so i don't so i don't think that you'll get to know kohelet much more than just what Kohelet means. It's not about an in-depth study of the book. It's using the wisdom of the book to talk about human life and its meaning. And she does a really spectacular job in just quoting an amazing wealth of material for that. Okay, so much for Erica Brown. Let's move down to book number three. Menachem Fish Kohelet, Searching for a Life Worth Living. This is the only one not published by Magid Koren Press of the four, by the way. It's published by Baylor University Press. Okay, so there you go. Menachem Fish doesn't claim to be a Bible commentary. He's not. He's a philosopher. He's a professional philosopher. That's his degree. And he likes a philosopher named uh, Karl Popper. P-O-P-P-E-R. Karl is spelled with a K if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, I've never read Karl Popper, but I could just tell you what Menachem Fish says, and I trust that he's right, uh, that Karl Popper believes that ideal science and rationality at their best, meaning this is when they're really at their best, they serve to disprove everything. They relentlessly challenge and re-challenge and re-challenge and re-challenge rather than trying to prove things. So basically, if you're a real scientist, you don't try to prove your theory and now you're done. You're constantly challenging that theory and questioning it and poking holes in it and trying to improve. And of course, with ideology, all the more so. There you're not proving stuff. It's really just about how do you refine the idea more and more and more and can you keep coming up with a better way? So he reads Kohelet through that lens. He likes Karl Popper anyhow, and then he tries to read Karl, uh, Kohelet through Popper's uh, glasses. So the truth is, I found that very appealing, not because I'm a philosopher, I'm not, I'm, I'm a Tanakh guy through and through, I, I do like ideas very much, uh, but, but I like the fact that Kohelet of all of our biblical books is relentless in his challenging of everything. He never lets you rest. 
He's constantly challenging basic axioms of wisdom. He's throwing human life experience at us time and again and so that we can never just say, okay, we finally have a resolution because there is no resolution. He's simply trying to come up with the best possible framework for life that we can live given all of the limitations which are simply part of the human experience. Death being the granddaddy of them all, but there are many, many other limitations even while we're here in this world. So he does that. He does that all. So I think Menachem Fish does a good job bringing this Karl Popper lens uh, through the entire through the entire book. Uh, that's the good news. The tough thing for him, and, and this is something which uh, I struggle with just as somebody who does care about what Kohelet himself means, is that he writes not a verse-by-verse -verse commentary because he's not pretending to be a commentator. He's giving his understanding of Kohelet in very brief introductory essays to each chapter. So on the one hand, it's really readable. If you just want a nice coffee table-esque book, we'll get to why it's a coffee table-esque book in just a minute or a few minutes perhaps, uh, it's it's a really good read just because of this Karl Popper thing, which I think is a very useful lens to look at Kohelet. Uh, the downside of Fish's commentary is that he still does need to comment, and it's not a systematic commentary because he doesn't claim that it is one. He even tells you at the beginning it's not going to be one, so I don't criticize him for that. I'm just saying that uh, you can't have an ideology that you hook to Kohelet unless you've learned it systematically. Right, because otherwise it just ends up being your own ideology and you're using verses in Kohelet to say what you anyway want to say, which is fine. You're allowed to do that, but that's no longer Kohelet, that's fish. So that's, I think, where we need to go with the rest of this uh, discussion. Uh, for example, fish criticizes the most classic interpretation of the word Hevel as uh, vanity. And he's right to criticize it. So then he comes up with ephemerality, or it's fleeting. So his argument is Kohelet is about how to live a meaningful life in our fleeting world. There's no question that that itself is correct. Kohelet is very driven by that point. Uh, but that, as we mentioned already in the Grossman discussion, that's not enough. Uh, Kohelet very plainly doesn't define Hevel as merely fleeting because there are plenty of life conditions that are permanent, and he still calls those Hevel too. The result of that is uh, the meaning of Hevel doesn't match the analysis, even though at least in this case, his point is correct. Uh, another thing that Fish tries to do is, I, I wish he had a systematic commentary just so I could see, can he really make this work? Because at least in the, in the broader analysis, I don't think it works at all. He tries to create some kind of linear progression in the book, which is always such an appealing thing to do. He tries to say that chapter two is the low point of the book where Kohelet is filled with despair. And then here comes the, you know, Pete Seeger song. You know, it's everything there is a season. I mean, it's not really Pete Seeger's song. It's just Kohelet chapter three. And then Pete Seeger just made that really catchy tune that really took off back in the, I and mean, he wrote the, the lyrics. He just added a few words, the turn, 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 you know, that kind of thing. In 1959, the birds are the ones who made it pop popular. I think they had the most popular version of it in the 1960s. It's a great song. You, I'm sure you can hear it on multiple venues in YouTube and other places, and that's fine. It's a great song. But in the meantime, uh, he takes that as the turning point of Kohelet, where suddenly Kohelet realizes, oh, I don't need to despair. There's a time and a place, and we just have to maximize our lives in this world, in, our fle in this fleeting world. Uh, the downside of this kind of interpretation in general is twofold. One, Kohelet repeatedly uh, points out life shortcomings throughout the book. He doesn't stop pointing them out in chapter two and suddenly goes on to an uptick. No, it's constantly going back and forth and focusing on this and that frustration, like that stillborn verse that I mentioned before, that's in chapter six, okay? That's not, that's past the turning point. So even after the so-called turning point, Kohelet continues to go back to moments of despair because there are certain frustrations of human experience that are simply not solvable. We can't solve them, nor are we going to try. Okay, so that's frustrating and Hevel and absurd and chaotic and all of those things. That's something that never goes away. There's not a linear progression to something happier. And the flip side is, uh, we saw these verses also. If you go back to source four, here he is at the end of chapter two, which is supposed to be his low point. There's nothing worthwhile for a man but to eat and drink and afford himself enjoyment with his means. And even that I know it comes from God, for who eats and who enjoys but myself. Okay, that theme runs through the entire book. 
as Jonathan Grossman says, he thinks it's a, the refrain from the book altogether. Be that as it may, uh, there's, it's very, very difficult, at least not in his essays, to detect any sort whatsoever of a linear progression in Kohelet. Quite to the contrary, Kohelet reflects on persistent human realities. We all die. Wisdom is limited and, and wise people are limited. Wealth is limited and wealth is not permanent. And yet we should enjoy all of life's blessings. We should pursue wisdom. We should be diligent workers, etc. And fear God. We should have that meaningful, we should have that meaningful life while we can, because that's all part of God's blessings. These are recurring and running themes through the entire book, and it's very difficult to see any kind of linear progression. So I find that a very difficult component of the book. Uh, another thing which it's it's really fascinating. This is a problem with learning Kohelet in general. We talked about it a little bit in week one, but now we can talk about it with regard to the to Fish's book and also Kerwin's book, which is coming up as the final book that we'll think about uh, this morning. Kohelet, like it or not, is wildly different from the other 23 books in Tanakh. And if you think that it's the same as the other 23 books, you will be wrong. Read it again and just look at the words. The reason why Kohelet jarred rabbinic interpreters from time immemorial is precisely because it's so different. So pretending that his messages are the same as those of the prophets is a pretense, but it's wrong. It's simply a mistake. So it happens that this plagues both Fish's book and also Kerwin's book, and we'll get to for totally different reasons. They both assume somehow that Kohelet is just like the prophets on something very fundamental, even though in both cases, Kohelet doesn't say either of these things at all. So Fish's big thing is social action. He's a big believer in the idea that we should not be passive and pious people, but rather we should be active and try to improve the world. I couldn't agree more with that sentiment. And the reason why I couldn't agree more is because every single prophet does that. Prophets of Israel were the leaders of God's word requires us to go out into the society that we live in. No matter wh where we live and when we live, there's going to be something we need to work on. Let's get on there and work on it. Work on ourselves and work on everybody else. Work on improving society. So it's not surprising to me that Menachem Fish expects that it's going to be in Kohelet too, because Kohelet is part of the Bible. And that is such a central axiom, you would think Kohelet must say it too. And so the problem is that Kohelet never says that. Uh, not only does he not say it, but he, well, look at source number nine. The one place where you would really expect him to see it is the beginning of chapter four. I further observed all the oppression that goes on under the sun. Okay, oppression. What are we going to do about it, people? The tears of the oppressed with none to comfort them and the power of their oppressors with none to comfort them. Then I counted those who died long since more fortunate than those who are still living. Once again, better if you already died rather than see this oppression. And happier than either are those who have not yet come into being and have never witnessed the miseries that go on under the sun. In other words, he's not saying, hey, everybody, let's go out there and fix the problems of the world. He's saying, this stinks. That's all he has to say about it, right? That's all he says anywhere in the book about any problem in the world, even one that potentially is addressable. Death we can't fix. Okay, we might live a little bit longer if we do this or that, but we're not going to cure human death. Uh, but this is something that, in principle, the prophets do try to do something about. They get out there and they try to fix things. They ideally could fix everything and then Mashiach would come. But even if no Mashiach, at least do something better. Everybody can make some social improvement. I couldn't agree more with Fish's point. It's just that Kohelet never, ever tries to do that. Kohelet's point is he's reflecting on the world from a purely human point of view and does not transcend himself or his human perspective. If you want to transcend your human perspective, read the other 23 biblical books. Kohelet simply does not do that. Uh, Fish tries to find his ideology in the book because there's nowhere where it says this. So he comes up with this in source number eight. So I decided as regards men to dissociate them from the divine beings and to face the fact that they are beasts. For in respect of the fate of man and the face of fate of beasts, they are one and the same fate. As one dies, so does the, dies the other. Both have the same life breath. Man has no superiority over beast, since both amount to nothing. It's very bleak. Uh, but what I care about today is, yes, it's bleak. But the point simply is, we all die. Not only do all people die, righteous and wicked, foolish and wise, uh, but even animals and we die. Okay, true. Uh, Menachem Fish reinterprets this passage rather significantly by saying, uh, 
people who are pious and passive, they are no better than beasts. But people who are socially active and try to improve society, they are better than beasts. Now, that may be true, although I don't think pious people who are passive are no better than beasts. I still think they're wonderful, but I agree with the activism message. But that's not Kohelet's point in the least. Kohelet's point very plainly is uh, we all die, and therefore, what is the advantage of people over animals? That's all he's doing here. Nothing fancier than that. So from this perspective, uh, Fish's attempt to try to find social action in Kohelet fails, and it has to fail because Kohelet is simply not about social action at all. He's about piety, he's about humility, he's about intellectual and religious humility, he's about working diligently, he's about pursuing wisdom, he's about acknowledging every last one of our shortcomings as human beings, and simply trying to live a life of blessing within that. So, uh, to summarize, Fish's strong point in his book is very much about uh, the Karl Popper thing, I think that's really his best thing, uh, just the relentless challenge to truth all the time and to every idea, I think that that is a great asset of this book, uh, trying to find social action or a linear progression in this book, I do not think either one of those things work. Before moving on to, to David Kerwin's book, I just want to point out that there is a bonus feature of this book. Menachem Fish has a cousin whose name is Deborah Band, B-A-N-D. Uh, she wrote a lot, of, wrote, she produced an awful lot of Kohelet-driven artwork that's in this book. That's the coffee table book part of the thing that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they're, really, they're good pictures. She does, she's a very talented artist. And not only does she make a lot of art, you know, not even chapter by chapter, it's really a lot of different pieces. I didn't sit there counting, but it's a, dozens of them. But then she writes a commentary on these pieces throughout the book just letting you know, here's why I did what I did and how it intersects with Kohelet's ideas. Most of her artwork just has to do with the fleetingness of life. There's a, she likes sprinkling mistiness onto various pictures depicting physical scenes, but sometimes she has more specific themes as well. I think that's a really cool feature of this book and something to, to bear in mind if you go that route. Okay, number four, David Kerwin. Kohelet, A Map to Eden. This is the fourth and final book that we'll be thinking about today. It's really cool that within, you know, here we are in the beginning of August, and you have four books out there all within a very short space of time. David Kerwin is a very, very creative man. So creativity is something that always inspires me because it's just amazing when somebody has such an unbelievable ability to make connections that you never, ever would have seen before. So Whenever you have a very creative work of connections of this kind, and this is very creative, and it's a very, very interesting series of, of, of connections that he makes, uh, every single reader is going to come to a different place in terms of how persuasive is this or that connection. So some people will read that and just be dazzled cover to cover. Other people will say, well, that's cool, but is it really there? And everybody's going to have a different threshold of where to go with that. So all I can do when I'm talking is tell you my threshold, and then you can read the book and decide where your threshold will be. Uh, so his main thesis, let me t start with his main thesis. Since Kohelet is traditionally ascribed to King Solomon, he imagines the following. The book of Kings, this is true. King Solomon seems righteous for most of his life, and then toward the very end of his life, he turns to idolatry. His hearts lead him, his wives lead him astray. It's a big mess. And shockingly, not only does King Solomon sin with idolatry in a very major way, uh, upending all of his gains in the book of Kings, but he doesn't seem to feel very bad about it, even after rebuked and criticized by the prophets. And that's something which is shocking. It's just the idea that, okay, somebody could sin. Anybody can sin. Tanakh is filled with examples of that. But at least like his father, King David, he feels really bad about his sins afterwards when confronted. King Solomon really seems to be a different person. So David Kerwin comes in and says, Kohelet is the answer to that problem. Kohelet is King Solomon's expression of guilt over his failed life and is telling us that we can always repent. Then he throws in a nice, interesting bonus. You know, we talked about how Hevel is the word that you need to define. So Hevel means ephemeral, vanity, absurd, chaotic, etc. we've discussed. But Hevel also is the first name of Adam the first's second son in Hebrew. We call him Abel in English, but that's Hevel. 
Okay, and the word Adam also, funny enough, appears many times in Kohelet, referring to humankind. It's not referring to Adam the person. Okay, but Kerwin connects Kohelet to Adam the person and to Hevel the person, and concludes that not only does Kohelet give voice to King Solomon's guilt over his failed life, but it also gives voice to Adam for his responsibility, whatever that might be, for letting Cain murder Abel. Okay, so these are very creative, very creative ideas, and they go very far afield. So I'll tell you, uh, for this type of analysis, I personally find it very unpersuasive, and you could read the book and you can come up with a totally different conclusion. Kerwin relies on a nexus of connections, which, you know, each one depends on the other. But when you break it down, uh, sometimes it can get very difficult to, to be persuaded. So I'll give you a couple of examples that he uses. He says, in Kohelet, it says, a good name is better than fragrant, fragrant oil. This is source 10 over here. And the day of death and the day of birth. Okay, Kohelet is telling you that reputation is golden. And he's also saying that there is benefit to the day of death. And what he goes on to say in the context of Kohelet is, if you are death conscious, then you lead a more meaningful life. Great message. It's, it's distressing at times, but it's a great message all the same. Okay, I'm cool with that. Since Kerwin views Kohelet as a personal reflection, he says that a good name is better than fragrant oil. King Solomon was anointed with anointing oil at the very beginning of his reign. And a good name is a repu still a reputation. So, Kohelet, so King Solomon here expresses regret. You know, I wish I were never king because I really ruined my life that way. Rather, I wish I had just lived a righteous life and had a better reputation. Okay, so... That's one example. Here's another one. And toward the very end of Kohelet, he says, Oh, youth, enjoy yourself while you are young. Let your heart lead you to enjoyment in the days of your youth. Follow the desires of your heart and the glances of your eyes, but know well that God will call you to account for all such things. To me, this sounds like another exhortation to all of humanity because uh, it is. Kohelet is talking to all of us. He's certainly not just reflecting on his own personal King Solomon life. Uh, but Kerwin does view it as he's looking at his own King Solomon life and saying, wow, dear reader, I, King Solomon, really blew it when I was young. I was so sinful. You should remember that God will hold you accountable. So don't make the same mistakes that I made. Okay, so that's the second one. Third one. Source 12, be not over eager to go to the house of God. More acceptable is obedience than the offering of fools, for they know nothing but to do wrong. Context of Kohelet, he's telling all of us, uh, don't just go to the temple and bring empty sacrifices, but rather stand with reverence and awe in front of God. If you're going to make a vow, make sure that you fulfill it, and, and so on. Simply good religious advice to all people who might seek God in the temple or somewhere else. Kerwin understands this, like the others, as personal reflections of King Solomon, and he says, you know, I wish I never built the temple because I worked the nation so hard and as a result, it just led to all kinds of problems. So these are just three representative examples. There are dozens and dozens of things that he brings down where he takes Kohelet's you know, well, seemingly universal advice to all people for all time and turning it into a very particular King Solomon confession of, boy, I really blew everything in my life as a mess. And dear reader, please don't make the mistakes I do, but rather repent. And if you repent, God's arms are always open. Okay, so there are, in my opinion, several problems with this entire way of learning. So just get them on out there. Uh, the most important part is that Kohelet is not a personal confession of King Solomon. I don't care how many parallels you have, simply not what, what Kohelet is about. Kohelet is wisdom for all people for all time. And Kohelet says this, source 13, a further word, because Kohelet was a sage, he continued to instruct the people. That's right. That's what he's doing. He listened to and tested the soundness of many maxims. The entire book of Kohelet, as, as it has always been understood, is that it's one man's divinely inspired wisdom for all people for all time. And that's really what it is. To say that this is just a personal experience uh, dialogue with himself and then telling us, learn from my mistakes. Don't sin like I sinned, but rather be righteous and repent. Uh, is, is simply not the way that Kohelet presents itself at all. So that's point number one. Uh, a, a similar problem, this goes back to Menachem Fish seeing social action everywhere. Uh, David Kerwin sees repentance everywhere in Kohelet, but the thing is, Kohelet never mentions repentance. 
Not once. He does talk about living a righteous life often. That's his thing. He talks about religious humility. Those are, those are his themes. But it's not about if you sin, you should repent. The prophets, once again, talk about repentance a lot. And they try to get people to repent a lot. But Kohelet doesn't do that. Kohelet is simply operating on a different plane and does not work like the rest of the books of prophecy. So rather than trying to get Kohelet to sound like the books of the prophets, it's better to simply hear Kohelet's own voice. And then just the flip side of it is, if you read the book of Kings, the book of Kings makes it amply clear that King Solomon sinned in his old age. Whereas the point here of, oh youth, enjoy yourself while you are young, because I sinned a lot when I was young, is just not correct of the narrative in Kings either. King Solomon was not a sinful king when he was young. He was truly righteous. And in fact, one of the, he is the exemplar of what an ideal king could be. So as far as the King Solomon slash Kohelet connection goes, I find this sort of approach very unconvincing. Okay, so much for that sort of thing. I would say the same about the Adam and Abel connections as well. They're very clever, uh, but it's very difficult to say that Kohelet was written to give Adam a voice to feel guilty about his responsibility for one of his sons murdering another one of his sons. Okay, so much for that piece. On the flip side, some of his connections are truly brilliant, and I don't want to walk away from here saying that it's all unconvincing. I find several of his connections not just creative, but really, really convincing. I'll give you my favorite example. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, you may recall that Adam and Eve were naked for a while, and then after they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, suddenly they felt shame, and that's when they put on fig leaves, and later on God made for them clothing, and that changed humanity forever. Okay, great. So Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch discusses just, well, what changed in them? So he comes up with a very interesting insight, which David Kerwin likes very much also, which is, God instilled in all of us a sense of shame. That's a human thing. And the shame basically is reminding us we're not like animals. But that is only triggered, that feeling is triggered only when we're sinful. Then suddenly we feel this terrible sense of shame. So Adam and Eve, before, when they were using their bodies properly in the service of God, they actually did not need clothing because there was no sense of shame. They were simply fulfilling their life purpose to the extreme. But once they sinned, suddenly that human instinct, which God implanted in all of us, kicked in. And suddenly they felt a sense of shame about everything, including the need for clothing. It's a really very interesting insight. And obviously there are many other explanations given to the before and after with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But okay, that's as good as any for now. David Kerwin takes that insight and applies it to a truly bizarre passage that I'm sorry that I haven't given more thought to, but I'm very grateful to Kerwin's book, well, to Kerwin for writing this book, just so that he can nail this point. On the Yom Kippurim ceremony in Leviticus chapter 16, uh, there's a really interesting and, and, and truly baffling passage. He says, the passage goes like this, and Aaron shall go into the tent of meeting, this is source 14, take off the linen vestments that he put on when he entered the shrine and leave them there. He shall bathe his body in water in the holy precinct and put on his vestments. Then he shall come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people, making expiation for himself and for the people. The fat of the sin offering he shall turn into smoke on the altar. So in the midst of this whole ceremony, because it's a nonstop ritual for the day, the high priest is supposed to go into the Holy of Holies, take off his linen vestments, right? And then leave them there. He shall then bathe. All right, pause. It sounds like this is crazy, right? It sounds like he has to get completely undressed in front of, in the Holy of Holies, leave these clothing in the temple, and then emerge in front of everybody, and then bathe. So Ramban notices this, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, he goes berserk. He says, that can't be. And he's, of course it can't be. How, how in the world is God commanding the high priest to disrobe in the Holy of Holies, come out naked in public, and then and leave behind his clothes till next year. What's up? So Ramban says all of these things. He says, it is completely impossible that the Torah would command Aaron to go to the tent of meeting for no reason, only to remove his clothing, be naked in God's sanctuary, and leave the garments there to rot. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's ridiculous. How could this possibly be? Uh, but yet, that's how the verses read. In addition to how counterintuitive that sounds, the Torah outlaws 
the high priest from ever exposing himself in the temple precincts. And in fact, it's at, at pains of death. So source 16 down here. You shall also make for them, this referring to the priests, linen breeches to cover their nakedness. They shall extend from the hips to the thighs. They shall be worn by Aaron and his sons when they enter the tent of meeting or when they approach the altar to officiate in the sanctuary so that they do not incur punishment and die. Okay, so not only would you and I just intuitively say, there's just no way, but the Torah goes out of its way to say they must wear these all the time, and if they don't, they will die. It shall be a law for all time for him and for his offspring to come. That's the kind of law we would expect. Source 14 is the crazy part. So something is up. Okay, so fortunately we have an oral law, because if we, you know, the Karaites, what are they going to do here? The, the simple reading of the text really does sound like what Ramban says absolutely cannot be. And I don't know what the Sadducee priests did when they if, when they were running the show. I don't know if they did this because, the, oh my goodness, that would be horrible. Uh, but in the meantime, the oral law gets involved here. It's in Masechet Yoma, page 32a, and Rashi quotes it on these verses. He says that you have to read these verses basically out of order. It goes like this. The high priest leaves the temple takes off his clothes to bathe, and then puts on his priestly garments and brings offerings. In other words, what you and I would just intuitively think has to be the way that it goes. There's no way that he gets undressed in the temple and then emerges naked. Right? Rather, he emerges with his clothes on, then he gets undressed, then he bathes, and then he goes on with the service. Okay, thank God for the oral law. That makes so much sense, and that's the way it has to be. But still, that doesn't take away the way the verses sound. So usually when you have a gap between the way the verses sound and the law, so the law is what they do. You better believe that the high priest, I'm sure, does exactly what the oral law commanded him to do. But still, do the verses come to teach a lesson? So David Kerwin very creatively says, this is the Garden of Eden. The whole point is that in principle, even though not in practice, the high priest can stand in the temple naked on Yom Kippur, specifically because you're back to that pristine state of atonement without shame. The whole point of this, the way the ritual is formulated, is so that we can restore the Garden of Eden. So without the high priest actually having to disrobe, because that's not what the law has him do, conceptually, this is a return to the Garden of Eden. There are many, many parallels. Kerwin doesn't make these parallels up. These parallels are very well attested between the Garden of Eden and the temple. So the idea is that when Adam and Eve sinned, they were filled with shame, had to clothe themselves, and they were then they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden was defended by the Keruvim, these angels with fiery swords. Okay. Welcome to the temple. All of a sudden here, the Kruvim on the Ark welcome the high priests with open wings and allow him to return to the Garden of Eden. This parallel system that David Kerwin has developed, I think, is just above and beyond fantastic. I found it not only persuasive, but from now on, when I teach the book of Leviticus, I am so good to quote him for this because I think it's really great. This is an excellent way of understanding the plain sense of the text in, in the ritual of Vayikra. So to summarize, there are some parallels that personally I find very unsatisfying and unpersuasive. And in general, I think it's much more important methodologically to distance Kohelet from the personal life of King Solomon. Whereas I think some of the networks of parallels that he comes up with are just above and beyond, uh, not only persuasive, but really just illuminating in a, in a wonderful way. Uh, we are coming to the end of our session. I did a good job on the timing. But just to summarize what these four books do, one thing that they don't do is give you four different commentaries on Kohelet. Rather, there's one commentary and three other books filled with different kinds of ideas. And uh, what I find useful is, this is what the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals really is all about, uh, is that there are different avenues to into tradition. Here you have four wildly different approaches. I mean, they're, they're not on the same page in any way, but here they are all looking at the same biblical book of Kohelet, trying to understand the meaning of the book and or life's meaning. And they have such different approaches to how to go about doing it. There's something there for everybody. And so I recommend whichever, you, you could decide which books sound appealing to you. I hope you read at least one of the four after this uh, that I think would already be worthwhile. And 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 that that's really what it's all about. I'm happy that I read all four just to at, at the same time to be thinking about not just four commentaries on Kohelet, but four wildly different approaches to this wonderful biblical book. On that happy note, I want to thank the Institute of Jewish Ideas and Ideals for 
for promoting this three three part series. I want to thank all of you for participating. I look forward to future learning with you in in the future. I wish you a great rest of summer, and thank you, and all the very very best. Take care. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.